2003. This is for the New Westminster Oral History Sports Project. The interviewee today is Mr. Alan Webster. So, Alan, what's your full name? Alan Webster. <laughs> and please tell me your current address. 827 16th Street, New Westminster. Good. Uh, what about your date and place of birth? I was born in a Welsh mining town in 1908. In Wales, obviously. Yes. yes. So, then how did you get from there to New Westminster? Well, my father was down there as a manager of a coal mine. He'd come down from Liverpool. And uh, in 1908, which is the year I was born, he went back to Liverpool. And he was an engineer on the Liverpool Mercury, a newspaper, which went belly up in about 1910. Mm. And there was a, uh, a bit of a depression in the old country at that time. So he headed for the colonies, mm. came out to Canada in 19, May of 1910, and spent his first summer in uh, Toronto without any air conditioning, and <laughs> like it. So he moved to Lethbridge in the winter. It was pretty cold. He didn't like that either. So he came out to the coast in the spring of 1911 when they had a, a nice march with sunshine every day and a little rain every night. So he thought they'd got the weather pretty well arranged here, so he sent for the family to come out. Right. And we came out at the end of 1911 to New Westminster. Right. And, and you've been here ever since, is that right? Yeah. Right. Um, please tell me your marital status. I'm a widower. Right. My wife died almost 10 years ago. Okay. And what was your wife's name and maiden name? Edith Medill. Edith Medill. And was she a New Westminster person as well? Uh, yes, I think she was born in Burnaby. Okay. Over where Imperial meets what is now Canada Way. Okay. Was then Douglas Road. Oh, okay. And do you have any children? We have two children, a girl and a boy. Barbara and Bruce. Right. Any grandchildren? Two grandchildren, a girl and a boy. Oh, good. <laughs> Worked out okay then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is a sports project. T tell me, uh, as a child, were you involved in sports in any way? Uh, not really. Uh, the schools then didn't have sports. I went to a little two-room, well, four-room school. It was only two rooms I used. <laughs> so uh, there was no organized sport. Right, right. You played, you kicked the ball, or it was one thing or another that was about a hit. Right. And uh, so I, I didn't really get into anything that was organized until I was about 14. Right. And that was into tennis. Oh, okay. And why tennis? Well, I had an older brother who played tennis. Mm -hmm. He was about nine years older than I was. And we went to a church which had a tennis court. Mm. So he started me on tennis when I was about 14. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, most churches had a tennis court. It's a kind of ongoing thing for them. There were a lot of private courts around. And my brother was uh, quite keen on tennis to the point where we built a tennis court at our own home, a grass court. Oh, yeah. It was kind of a poor business because we got us into the operation in 1928 uh, in the fall. We played one or two games on it. And the next year, my brother went up north as an engineer on one of the steering wheels that ran on the Mackenzie River. Mm -hmm. So he was away all the year, uh, from spring to fall. And I was at university at that time, and I went out on survey from uh, uh, July, August, and September. So I missed the Tennessee <laughs> too on the courts. And, uh, but after that, we used the courts fairly frequently. Fairly your, your own, you did. Your yeah. own courts, yeah. yeah. But there were a lot of private courts around of different kinds, you know, mm. dirt courts, concrete courts. And, oh, really? And uh, some of the churches had board courts. Mm. Board meaning wooden. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And those would be outdoor. Yes. Really. Really. Yeah. There were no uh, no indoor courts until I can't think of the name. Must be 
1930. They got uh, into our courts in out at Hastings Park in one of the oh, okay. one of the buildings there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a few of the summer players joined that club there. Right. So when you first started at 14, was there an organized sort of league or club in New Westminster? Yes, yes, there was the, the Westminster Tennis Club. And, and were you part of that then? No. No. That was looked on as a, uh, kind of a rich person's club <laughs> that uh, you didn't get into it. Oh, okay. Too well, there were, there were organized leagues. There was one which involved ch mainly church clubs. Mm -hmm. And went out to Cedar Cottage and mm -hmm. that, that all. My brother played at that league. Of course, I was just fumbling around from that time. But I remember the, the church club, the, the ladies would come and play uh, in long skirts and. Really? And, uh, of course, everybody wore long pants. We weren't in white, but we uh, wore long pants. And you didn't hit a hard ball with the ladies. You treated them with respect, you know. Only a cad would hit a hard ball to a lady, you know. So it was kind of a, a mixed up time. And then, uh, let's see, when I was about 16, my father built a camp down at White Rock in 1924. So when I went there, my brother and I found there were two board courts in White Rock. And so we played there. We, I forget, we paid $10 or something to play for a month, you know. Really? Yeah. And then I was down the next year in my, in my summer holidays from high school. And I played pretty regularly. There was a group of young people that played there every morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we played through. The next year I started playing at White Rock, but I got a job delivering milk in White Rock, which cut into my time for playing tennis, you know. And I, it was kind of uh, kind of hit and miss for quite a long time. I, when I went to university, I, I, I played there. Not very successfully. I was never a very good player. And uh, then I didn't play a great deal. We were working in the summertime until 1932. We just couldn't get any work in 1932. It was nothing doing. That was the Depression. Yeah. yeah. And so we, uh, we formed a league up in... Uh, in it, around Edmonds, we had six clubs in the league. We had our grass court, a concrete court, a dirt court, another grass court. And St. Albans, the church on uh, the corner of Edmonds and, and uh, Douglas Road had a board court. And the Gordon Presbyterian Church still had their center court. Okay. So we had six teams when we formed the Edmonds Tennis League. And that was just New Westminster, is that right? Or Burnaby? Burnaby, and that's pretty well close mm. too, you know. A little later on, Queens, uh, Queens Avenue got a board court and they came in the league too. But uh, we went out and expended two dollars on a cup. And I still have the cup in there. So oh yeah. We, uh, we won it the first year of Webster's. I forget who won it the second year, then we won it the third year, which would be 1934, 35, and things started to open up, and people went away to work, so the league didn't go after that, so that's mm. how we still have the cup. <laughs> so, uh, uh, then there was a club started up on the corner of Gilly Avenue and Kingsway, called the Ridgefield Club, and it was started by a, an English family up there named Wells, and I think they had four or five hardtop courts, mm. so I, I joined up there. This is late 30s, is that right? That was about 30, 35, 30, oh, okay. no, wait a minute, 34, 33. Oh, okay. 
because in 1934 I went to Victoria to work. And I played at the Hillside Club in Victoria, which is a very similar to Westminster Three Clay Courts. Mm. And uh, so I played there and I was there two years, I think. It was kind of a hit and miss thing. In the meantime, my wife, I joined Westminster Tennis Club in 1931. Mm. So I, I came, well, I went from Victoria up country, and I came back in 1936, the end of 36, and I joined the Westminster Tennis Club in 1937. Mm. At that time, you put in an application to join. Oh, really? And they had a meeting, an executive meeting, to decide whether or not you would be accepted. What, why is that? I say it was a <laughs> club that you didn't just bounce into, you know. Right, right. <laughs> Hootie tootie. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, although I never found anybody in it that was pretty, <laughs> you know. In fact, it was, it was a club, it was, uh, everybody played with everybody. Right. Um, not like a lot of clubs are now. Uh, you know, if four people came down to play and one person was waiting, when they finished their set, one would drop out and invite the other one in to play. And it went like that for many years. Mm. Uh, it's no longer like that. Very few clubs are. Mm. And it's kind of amusing because uh, my wife and I started the White Rock Club in 1968. And it was very much... Uh, Everybody played with everybody. Uh, juniors came and played with us. Seniors too. Mm -hmm. But now they have junior times. And if the kids, we had an occasion where the kids were playing a league match and ran, ran over the 12 o'clock limit. The last two matches, the seniors came down, and kicked them off, what left the match incomplete. Really? Yes. And the the. Uh, the players there, uh, some of them won't play with everybody. They have their own little lunch. And if they're there, they'll keep on just turning around. If anybody sitting can wait. Hmm. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think a lot of it came from when the indoor courts started up, where they booked they booked courts. Hmm. So four people book a court, and of course they wouldn't give it up to anybody else. Hmm. Hmm. I think that's a lot of it. But uh, I was thinking over, and I think the, a lot of the clubs got started up in B.C. because we had an influx of people from England. And when they came out, the first thing they did was build a tennis court. Oh, yeah. So uh, I think I told you about the court at Nelson, mm -hmm. where they hung people from the back end of the court. Right. Well, why don't you tell us on tape here? Well, uh and Nelson had a clay court, which was uh, alongside the Justice Building. And in the early days, when a chap was sentenced to death, they didn't horse around with a lot of appeals and that. They marched him out of the Justice Building, out of the tennis court, and hung him. <laughs> it, th that's recorded in the museum in Nelson. Really? I'm not just imagining that. Yeah. And when they were building the great... Uh, uh, North and Alberta Railway, in the uh, a siding, the Wembley siding, there were a group of fellows who were interested in tennis. So they built a tennis court and started a league, which involved the Pouche Coupe, uh, Peace River, Dawson Creek, and one other, uh, one other club I can't remember. And they ran a league there. It was kind of involved. There were ten, ten players on the league and on the team, including two juniors. And uh, so they, they put up the Wembley Trophy. And the Wembley Trophy got lost and was found in a church basement in 1962. So they reorganized the league. Mm. And I was up in, in Dawson Creek and was visiting the head man of tennis in Dawson Creek. He was a real estate man that went in his office and he said, uh, 
How do you do? He said, we won the Wembley Trophy. Mm. I said, well, congratulations, what's the Wembley Trophy? I never heard of it, you know. So it was still going. That was in 1974. And as far as I know, it's still going, mm. you know. Mm. Now, there are a lot of stories like that around around B.C. And uh, as I say, I've been trying to get either Tennis B.C. or the Tennis Patrons to approach it on an organized basis. Now, they wouldn't have to do any effort to collect these back history. All they have to do is contact somebody in the area, an old, old, old timer, mm-hmm. and they'll gab away. There's one chap, Charlie Dorr, in Kelowna, who has written a, a book on the history of tennis in Kelowna. Mm-hmm. And there's fellas, but they're all dropping off the twig, you know. Mm-hmm. So we, the history mm-hmm. is getting away. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, many of them run tournaments for years. Like Trail and Nelson, they alternate years. They have the, the West Kootenai, I think it is. Okay. And their trophies back in, well, uh, Barbara and my wife are the ladies' doubles up at Vernon, which is one of these tournaments that goes on Labor Weekend, you know. Okay. And their trophy dated back to 1911. Really? And with deer horn handles and all that, you know. <laughs> Somebody gave that trophy. Who? I don't know if you'd ever find out. Right, right. Barbara and her partner won a, a trophy of Penticton Ladies Doubles, the Ainsley Trophy. So Barb tried to find out who Mrs. Ainsley was that presented, presented that trophy. Nobody could tell him that. It's just legend there's, almost. There's right? a Burke Trophy in the, in the, in the Okanagan for men's doubles. Mm-hmm. Who, who Mr. Burke was, nobody knows. <laughs> and there's all kinds of these things. Right. And I thought it would be nice if they could find out, find out who these people were, yeah. if, they, if they could, you know. Yeah. Well, what about here in New Westminster? What, what sort of, what, what's sort of the legacy of tennis here? Well, New Westminster Tennis Club started about 1890. Okay. With, uh, Two grass courts lower down the hill than where they are now. Mm. And in 1901, a chap named Lewis, who was suspected as a relative of the Lewis you were talking about, and another chap asked Victoria if they could use the site which was reserved for the Parliament Village, the temporary part, mm-hmm. if they could use it for a tennis court, tennis club, uh, until it was required for the Parliament buildings. Of course, Victoria had the Parliament buildings by that time. And they paid a dollar a year rental for the for the property. In 1933, it was turned over to the city for park purposes. Okay. And we continued to rent it from the park for a dollar a year. Hmm. And these two chaps built three clay courts on the present site. Mm-hmm. So the club moved there in 1901. But it had been an active club because uh, in the Vancouver Lawn Tennis they had a clipping from a paper whereby the New Westminster team had come over and beaten the Vancouver team mm. tennis well after since 1896. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, I, I saw it the other day and some of them here too. And uh, so, so 1890, and sometime be- before that, the South Cowichan Club started. Okay. South Cowichan is the oldest club in, in BC. Oh, okay. And they were all grass courts. All grass courts. It's a grass court tournament. They have a couple of hard courts too, but they run a grass court tournament. So mm. Barb went over some years ago and one won the singles there, so she, she got a name on the singles trophy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's a, an old club, obviously, and put in by English settlers, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it, it's a nice club, except there's a creek runs near it, and then the mosquito season is terrible. I bet, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, you mentioned that, I mean, you joined the New Westminster Club. 
Yeah. And you were a part of that. Now, how long were you an active sort of player in tennis? I played until I was 87. No kidding. I played my last. No, it wasn't good tennis. <laughs> so I never. The only trophies I ever won were when I played with Bruce, uh, Don Whitrock. He won the men's doubles a couple of times. And the other time was when I played with this chap in Gladstone, as I was talking about. Mm. We won the veterans down at uh, Westminster. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, that's all I ever had. But uh, two years ago, I was presented with the Distinguished Service Award for Tennis Canada. Okay. And the chap who made this up gave a record of all his, my involvement with tennis. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's a lawyer, so a lot of malarkey in there, you know. But anyway, and they said Gladstone, he was presented with the same award the same year. Oh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but he, he, uh, was a very competitive player. Right. I played him a couple of times in a veteran's song at Westminster and didn't get much out of it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but my uh, uh, my family, we went to these weekend tournaments in Trail and Melt and uh, Vernon, mm -hmm. and it was very handy because Marv and Bruce could play singles mm -hmm. and they play mixed together. Marv and her mother would play ladies doubles, Bruce and I play men's doubles, and Edith and I play mixed doubles. So we, it was a real family affair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we kept us busy the whole weekend, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, Bruce and uh, and Barbie did pretty well in the tournament, you know. And, did they? Yeah. And Barb and her mother were in the final of one of, the, I guess, of the trail tournament. Besides winning the one at to Vernon, uh, Bruce could never get very far with me as his partner in doubles, but he won the consolations in uh, the trail tournament. Okay. So he. He did pretty well. But it was a lot of fun to go away for the weekend, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and how, how did it work then? Um, how would you get from playing in a place like New Westminster to playing, say, the Nationals? How, 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 what's the sequence there? Well, uh, the Nationals, I thought, was kind of alternating sometimes in the West, sometimes in the East. Okay. And people just entered. Okay. They just put their name in and they answer it in the national. Oh, okay. And I thought, you know, they have a, some fair hope of getting past the first round, which they may or may not do. But, uh, we, we've had players at New West who ranked, who are Canadian ranks, you know. And right. We're number one in ladies' doubles, so it's just that type of thing. And uh, one of them who played at New Westminster is going back to Turkey in the fall to play on the Canadian team. Oh, really? In Turkey. Right. And strangely enough, another friend of ours is going, another lady right. is going to Turkey too. Right, right. So it's very much you, you just uh, enter mm. and away you go. Right. Did you ever enter in anything no, like no, that? No, no, no. I don't know how that love at all. Barb might have been, but she she was the manager. Hmm. Tell tell me a little bit about um, your your involvement in tennis outside of just a player. Well, <laughs> uh, at the at the club, I was president in 1950, and. Where our membership was down, well, we had to rebuild the tent fences, we rebuilt the clubhouse, and, and then we started programs for coaching senior beginners, a three-year program, mm -hmm. where they could come down and be coached, uh, not to sure, once a week or twice a week, and they didn't pay any fees. The second year, they paid a limited fee. The third year, they played the full fee, and they mm. were members of the club. So we brought in 
people through that program who were still playing at the club. Mm. And that's going back a good many years. And we pushed junior tennis. Sorry? We, we pushed junior tennis. Oh, okay. And uh, we got coaches in. And uh, this chap who nominated me for uh, this award, Bob Wright, is a Queen's Council and stuff, but he was a junior. And he and Barber played in the junior league. Mm -hmm. so they never lost a match. They never lost a match. Oh. And uh, so later on, he was, uh, I was with, going back in 1959, I went to the council, you know, BC Lawn Tennis Council, representing the club. Later on, I became the chairman of the nominating committee. And I found that we were recycling on a lot of old chaps, you know, Jack Pedler, Jim Skelton, and that sort of heavy. And I thought we were always trying to get a grant from uh, the government. And Bob Wright was heavy in basketball. Mm -hmm. And he was used to applying for grants one thing and another. So I put the arm on him and I said, look, how would you like to be president of the tennis, PC Lawn Tennis? So he went for it. And got him in, and uh, from there he went on and became the president of the Tennis Canada. Okay. And uh, he always is whining at me, saying I got him into a lot of trouble. And I said, well, he should be on his knees thanking me, because he got he got <coughs> tickets to the Italian Open, the French Open, Wimbledon as president of Tennis uh, Tennis Canada. Okay. So why should he be whining about it? <laughs> Anyway, he he was uh, involved that way, and uh, juniors came up. Um, Barbara? Barbara's a level three coach. She is now? Yes. Oh, okay. And Bruce is a level two coach. No kidding. You know, they, they went into that. And uh, Barb played a, quite a lot of tennis and played for different teams, you know, like they have what they call a women's plate. And they play, she played, she was up country and played for Galona. And uh, so I, I, I was involved in pushing juniors, and I have been for quite a long time. I, playing at the White Rock Club, which is, uh, oh, I guess we had three courts, but small clubs. And I thought there was a need for, uh, a more social league than we play in the regular tenant and uh, Vancouver leagues, you know. Mm. So we started what we called the mixed league. It was called the beach league because uh, it was White Rock, Dawson, uh, Crescent, Sunshine Hills, and U.S. Minster. All, all outdoor clubs. And we started this league in 1969. Mm. And there's a four men, four women, and it's more social than the, the heavy leagues with the big players in. We limited, they couldn't have uh, the top rank players in, right. in these leagues. Oh, I see. Just to give people a chance to play, is that chance right? Chance to or? play competitive tennis, visit other clubs. And, mm -hmm. and that league is still going. Oh, really? It's still, still working. In the juniors, they had the big league, uh, Vancouver and District League, which was about 18 teams. And they played in sections, and I found that White Rock, just White Rock players would win their section. Then they'd run into Jericho, or Western Indoor, covered uh, indoor courts, with about 150 juniors to choose from. And we didn't get anywhere. So I suggested to Tennis BC that they should do the same as uh, swimmers do, which have winter swimmers and summer swimmers. And winter swimmers can't compete in summer games. Oh, okay. And uh, so I said, let's break it down and have clubs without indoor facilities play in a league of their own. But they wouldn't go for it. Oh. So, so I formed a bootleg league of, <laughs> of summer players. There's Westminster, White Rock, Crescent Beach, Sunshine Hills and Tawasson. Right. And that is still going, except Westminster dropped out of it. 
They dropped out. Yeah. And, okay. So we still have the four four teams playing. They've been playing for, I think, about eighteen years now. Mm. I got, I got out of the I ran it till last year. I turned it over to to Bruce. To your son. Yeah. Yeah. So he can have the headache of setting up the schedules and all the rest of it, you know. And is he still involved? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's, uh, he phones me and complains every once in a while that I've, I've, <laughs> I've dumped on him, you know. Ah. Then in uh, with Tennis BC, I got involved in a number of things. I was chairman of the discipline committee for three years. And I finally resigned because they wouldn't back my recommendations. I had one one chap who was always in the glue with, with complaints about you know, throwing his racket. In fact, he nearly knocked the umpire up his stand with his racket. But I noticed that uh, the next time the juniors played, it was the same way. And if this chap get get away with it, they would do it. You know? Right. So I finally, I recommended that he be banned from playing in any sanctioned tournaments for life. You know, I have five of them, that pick up my guy. And Tennis BC wouldn't back me up. So I said, okay, get yourself another chairman of your discipline committee. I'm not going to waste my time this way. Right. Uh, then I became regional director. I came up with an idea. I used to be traveling for the department here. I worked for public works, and I was traveling around the country a lot. You know? Right. But one night I was sitting down in the old Starlight Motel in, uh, in, in Osoyoos, and I thought, well, why can't we organize tennis Tennis BC, the same as the Association of Professional Engineers, who have regional uh, groups organized all up through the province. Right. And they come down with their ideas to the main people, you know, and all that. So I, I developed the idea that we should organize it on a geographical basis where you have a number of clubs within reasonable distance of each other so you form leagues and have organized leagues. Right. And I, I put it around and broke down the province of that. So they went for it. When was this? What 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 era was this? No, it was uh, probably around 1969 or 70 or something like that. So prior to this, they didn't have regions then. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we formed like, uh, well, in the Okanagan, taking in Kamloops and down through the Okanagan and over to uh, Merritt, mm-hmm. places like that. Mm-hmm. Have a bunch on the Gulf Islands. Mm-hmm. And have uh, the, the islands, and you're getting spaced out farther and farther, but you find people up in. Uh, I prepared to travel at some distance, you know, to play a league match. Mm. And it can be worked out to you and play, stay overnight and play two matches home and away mm. and go back and do the same. Mm. So I got to, uh, and also I wanted to have kind of junior tournaments in different age groups and then bring the winners in the age groups down to a central BC uh, tournament, which they had a closed BC junior tournament at the time, but it was all just Vancouver. And, right. And bring them down. I never got very far with that. But I did get uh, the Tennis BC to present a set of trophies to each of these areas for the juniors to play for, you know. Mm-hmm. It kept the name of the BC LTA in front of the local bunch and the kids would get their names on. That didn't get very far either. <laughs> I don't know where those trophies are. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, so this is what I was doing. And my wife and I, in 1975, we traveled visiting all the clubs uh, through the province. Oh, yeah. Most of the clubs. And spurring them on to doing this local thing, you know. It was pretty hard to get it 
get a, 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 a chairman of the league, you know, it was work. I bet. You had to get yeah. somebody who's enthusiastic, who's prepared to work. I had to fire one guy, the Kamloops chairman. He wasn't doing anything. <laughs> so I got rid of him. And uh, so we would, we visited all the clubs we could. We were away for three weeks, I think. We had a lot of fun because we played at all these clubs too. You know? Right. And uh, that's where I picked up the story about the Wembley Trophy. Mm. And uh, but that was about my last gasp on that thing. I put a report into VCLTA. But uh, later on, I pushed for, you know, they give this award for uh, your contribution to tennis each year. It was all Vancouver people that gave this award. So I pushed and I got a fellow, Suzuki. I went into Cornell and I found this fellow Suzuki coaching a bunch of juniors. And apparently he'd been giving up a lot of time and doing this for quite some time. So I put his name in to get the Mr. Tennis. And Ernie Winter up in, uh, in Kelowna, He'd been around tennis for God knows how long. He was one of the early age people coming out okay. who was sparking that. So that him made Mr. Tennis one year. Okay. And Ned Rhodes up in the uh, trail, who played tennis for about a hundred years up there. <laughs> so I got him made Mr. Tennis. So we got it spread out a bit, you know. Yeah. Actually, my wife and I have made Mr. and Mrs. Tennis since 1974. Did you? <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. That was the first time the lady had been on the, right. on the thing, you know. But my wife was uh, uh, quite enthusiastic, you know. She was a phys ed teacher. Oh, okay. And uh, we were going down to White Rock, and they had uh, had two courts. My wife went up there, and there were a bunch of kids cycling around doing various things, but anything looked like tennis on the courts, you know. So she said, well, would you like to learn to play tennis? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. So she charged them a dollar a week to pay for balls and stuff like that. They got coached five days a week. And this started with about 30 players in uh, 62. And it rose to 130 players, including senior women in not too long, you know, people were anxious to play. Right. And I was down there and I noticed she had some good juniors there, juniors who would have been ranked if they'd been able to get into Stanley Park to play in the Stanley Park tournament, which was a, a must if you're going to be ranked. Oh, okay. But there was no way they were going to get from there quite off to Vancouver to play at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, which is when it started. And uh, so I asked my wife, I said, well, why don't you put your kids in a, this mixed, this uh, Vancouver District Junior League? And being on council, I found that they uh, had to have a sponsoring senior club. So my wife and I started to form a club at White Rock and the sponsored these juniors. Okay. And we got the club formed in uh, 1968 down there, put the juniors in the league and they won it four out of five quality years really yes wow so <laughs> well we felt we'd done it all right you know yeah so from there on we kept on trying to form get the club going there right. and my wife had done so much for tennis they, uh, they built a third court mm. they needed the three courts and then i I, uh, I became president of the club and was 70 Seven or something like that. I was wearing two hats because I was still secretary treasurer down here when I was president down at White Rock, you know. Uh, secretary treasurer in New Westminster. New Westminster, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then we, we built a clubhouse down there. Uh, it was a real chance of opportunity. We had a chap who joined the club to play tennis. And he was a manual training instructor at some school. And they built a house for some chap who wanted to take it down across the line and set it up at Birch Bay or something like this, you know. And they found he couldn't do it for various reasons, you know. So 
I said, well, fine, can we get this thing for the price of the material? He said, yeah. Also, he'd send a crew of kids over to, to build this as part of their manual training. Mm-hmm. So we got a clubhouse for a very reasonable price. I bet. <laughs> but you've got to grab these opportunities. Yeah, you know? yeah. So it, it, it's, still, it's adequate for the size of the club. Now, mm-hmm. you know? Every once in a while, some clown comes in and wants to extend it all over the place. But you, know, you don't need it. Mm-hmm. You don't need it. You got a place where you can have coffee. They keep their records and all that. So what more do they want? Mm. So uh, anyway, uh, Bruce is the junior director down there. So he he lays on the programs for the juniors mm. and takes care of the Mel takes care of the league. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that is uh, roughly what we've been doing. Right. In tennis over the past many years, <laughs> quite, quite a few yeah. years. Well, eighty years, a little over eighty years. Yeah. Now you've mentioned um, a little bit about the facilities here in New Westminster. How how have they changed from when you first began in these little church leagues and then Edmonds League to what it is now? Well, we got along quite well with the clay courts. A long time because we could get a lot of volunteer labor. There's a lot of work in clay courts. There, oh, okay. And every spring we get the volunteer crews out and we break the courts up. You know, they kind of cake and one mm-hmm. thing another. We break them up about two inches deep and then we level them and roll them one mm-hmm. to another for the new season and then put down the tapes and everything like that. Well, it was getting to the stage where you couldn't get volunteer labor, you know. And they say, yeah, we've paid our dues. We don't have to come and work, too, you know. And uh, so there's been talk of putting in hard courts. About this time, I was getting away from playing at Westminster. I wasn't playing that much. I'd play down at uh, White Rock when I did play on weekends, you know. And they said Gladstone, he, he was very much against play. Uh, Getting rid of the clay courts. Clay courts are easy to play on. They're easy on your leg bones. You know, oh, okay. Another, you know. Just because it's softer, is that right? Yeah, or, no, right. You, you slide into your shots. You don't stop with a whoop. Oh, <laughs> I, I see. <laughs> and uh, we had a chap down there who was uh, prepared to spend any money that wasn't his own to get these things done, you know. Let the club borrow money up to the. I was there active till 1978, and we didn't do anything until we had the money. We didn't go getting loans for various things. We built the clubhouse in 1950 for $2,200, and this was 16 by 48 or something like that, you know. We got we scrounged a former president of the club. Had the yellow cedar fir factory over on the, the south shore. He he donated the roof for the thing, all four by six double tiled roof cedar, you know. Mm-hmm. Another chap by God gave us the, the roofing to go over with us, roof, you know, mm-hmm. for free. <laughs> Other chaps donated to uh, concrete pedestals for the foundations for free. Mm-hmm. And so they put it in for $2,200. Well, for some reason, there's a movement in the club that this wasn't big enough. And I was saying, well, you can fire a shotgun from one door to the other and not hit anybody in the club <laughs> most of the time. You know, We use it for tea on Sunday afternoon, that type of thing. But they kept pressuring, and finally I was going to meetings, and they were saying that, the clubhouse we had built was dangerous. Well, I resented that. And uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but when we built the club, now we're working on 40 pounds per square foot load of buildings. And at that time, the type of wood we could get in 1959 and 60, you could use two by six on an eight foot span, which suited us because uh, they were 16 feet wide. Right. Well, the type of lumber they get now, they have to use at least a two by eight 
of a six foot on an eight foot span or possibly a two by ten. So unless you're experienced in wood, uh, they say, oh, it's dangerous. It's not good enough. And the building inspectors go down the building codes now. They say, oh, it's dangerous. And they got two consultants in who said it's dangerous. And I'm claiming, they say, well, are you saying that the, these consulting engineers don't know what they're doing? I said, well, I'm a consulting engineer too. I'm saying they're operating outside the area of their expertise. They're concrete people. Wood, wood is a lot different. It's, a, it's an organism. And I, I worked with wood for 35 years building structures and maintaining them and all that. And I was chairman of the Wood Laminated Administration Board. And I was a member of the uh, Treaters of Wood people mm. and you know, all this kind of thing. Right. I even right. wrote a pamphlet on wood design. And I felt I knew more about wood than these clowns were doing there. So I resented them saying that they had to have a new clubhouse because this was dangerous. It wasn't. It was good for another 30 years. Anyway, they went ahead and they built the top house they have now, which I suspect cost them about $280,000, which they're still paying on a loan from a bank and all that kind of thing. So I kind of turned my back on them. I wouldn't have any part of it, you know. Right. So anyway, they've got their top house and they've got the two Jews. But in the meantime, they got their four hard courts and they're all over the courts and got lighting. So they had an attractive deal, except they don't have any winter tennis. I, I'd say they'd have done far better for tennis if they'd taken the money they spent on the clubhouse and covered two of the courts. So right. they'd have indoor tennis. Mm. But I'm just an old, stupid old stone so <laughs> <laughs> What was it like... Um especially in the early years, what, if you had a tournament or something, would, would the neighborhood come out to watch? No, not especially. I don't recall. Maybe some friends would turn out, but that's right. about all. You know? Right, right. The thing that surprises me, though, is when I was first at that club, for two weeks at the end of June, they ran the open club tournament, and they ran the club handicap tournament. Hmm. Uh, everybody was in the handicapped. Everybody was placed in there and paired up and they were handicapped and one thing or another. And they ran it in two weeks. Hmm. And they didn't have, uh, didn't have, uh, uh, tiebreakers as they have now where you can't have more than you play six all and you play a tiebreaker on points. We used to play it out, you know, in 17, 15 and that type of thing. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sure. Right. And uh, so how they ever did, I, I don't know. <laughs> but they they did. And uh, but now even with the even with the tiebreakers, they had trouble fitting in the tournament. Mm. And, mm. Uh, and now they've got a point system. Uh, they have various levels. And you have a, a two point five players, three point three point five, four four point five. Hmm. Five point five, you're getting up into the pro ranks pretty well. Oh, okay. Uh, so they have, they run a tournament in each of these point rankings. Right. You know? Right. And and is that sort of a generic way, like the other places in North America do that? And yeah, you know? it's supposed to be like on the Australian system, whereby you can go to a club and say, I, I'm a. What is it? Forget about anything. Basically, you say, "I'm a three, I'm a three player," mm. so they know what you fit into, mm. and it gives you the basis on the tournament that you're not going to meet, get bumped in the first round by meeting a 4.5 player. Right. You have a ghost chance. Of, right. So that, that's a, one thing. They have all that. One thing I haven't mentioned that. Uh, we have records of all the winners of the tournaments from 1906 on down to the Westminster Club. Oh, really? In 1958 was this uh, 
centennial of the city. Mm -hmm. And my wife got on a committee whereby they were putting up a placard of uh, tennis winners from 1906. And the secretaries at that time used to keep in their, in their secretary uh, records the winners of the tournament. So uh, Edith and the secretary said Richards went back and found all these people. And I got my chief draftsman over at the office to build up big four by four boards with the names on. Okay. And when that was over, I thought that was a good idea. So I went back and organized it on boards both soul by soul and kept the names up and carried it on. Right. My daughter's doing it now. Oh, really? And uh, there's a few gaps. And they're, they're, they're trying to fill those in. But they've got a record from 1906 right through. Mm. <clears throat> I was doing the same. We, we started an open tournament in 1963. And I was keeping a record of that too. But I don't think that open tournament became a Hayek, uh, Hayek tournament. Mm. And it's the first of a series of tournaments around BC. And they haven't kept the records, I don't think. Of that. Yeah. Well, I'd imagine somebody must have the records somewhere, but. Well, if they get the trophies back, they probably get the names off the trophies, mm. you know. Mm. The other thing, our connection, they formed the Webster Cup probably about 19, late 1980s. Here in New Westminster? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a sanctioned tournament for, for ladies doubles. Okay. And it was going quite well until it fell into the hands of a chap who was not really interested and he ran it into the ground. Mm. So the cup, I got stung for a cup too for that thing. Mm. You know, the, the lady who was organizing it phoned me and said, what do you think the idea is? Said, fine, fine. And I'll present the cup. So it died out. The cup was down in their trophy cabinet down there. When, when my wife died, I wondered what they would do as kind of a uh, memorial to her. White Rock, since she'd been a founder of the club, and knew Westminster because she'd been an early member and had been on the, the council for quite a while, and also been on council with uh, Tennis BC. Mm. So they decided to hold a tournament uh, each year at the end of September alternating White Rock and New Westminster. Okay. And see Edith Webster Memorial Tournament. Mm. I'm not sure how it's organized, but it involves doubles and singles mm. and uh, the whole thing. It's a kind of a whole day affair. You know? mm. Now, how long they'll keep it up is hard to say. Well, you're right. I guess these tournaments can be fluid after a while. Yeah, well, nobody knows the people that they're... Uh, the first time, again, I presented a trophy, and the first time I presented it, I, I said to the people from Westminster, I said, you, you didn't know her. Mm. There were only one or two, but I said she was a long-time member, she's a lady's double.